Let's open up to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to begin to look today, as we talked about last week, how that in the life of a Jewish person, when we start talking about prayer and we can talk about the fellowship aspect of fellowshipping with God and how that pattern obviously has been given to us all throughout the Scripture, that there was a, a rhythm about their life in fellowship with God on a daily basis. That rhythm began in the evening, actually, because at the sunset of a day, a new day begins in their way of calculating days and nights. And so it really begins in the evening, and you'll see that in just a few moments. But they we had a pattern of prayer, and that pattern of prayer consisted of generally three times a day, and we see that, and we saw that in David, we saw it as well as in Daniel. And we know that historically there was a type of prayer service or daily prayer that was developed by the assembly of great men and some of the prophets during the time of Ezra. And Ezra was part of this group that developed this pattern of prayer, which by the time Jesus was born and came into this world was an established daily fact. And so this would have been something that he, as well as his disciples, practiced regularly. And they engaged in this. And we're going to see, and you'll begin to see a little bit of it today, that from this daily prayer, which is called the Amidah, you'll notice how Jesus is going to take and extract from it some of the main themes. And He's going to take that and condense it into what we call the Lord's Prayer. As we saw last week in the Didache, which was the basically the, the, the teaching manual for the early church for the first several centuries especially, which a new believer would come in and these are the things that they would be taught. One of those things in the 8th chapter of that uh, treatise talks about when you pray, and, they would, and it recited the Lord's Prayer, and it said this pray three times a day. They were following this Jewish pattern of an evening, morning, and noon kind of praying. So it's prayer for a, a follower of God, a follower of Jesus, like I said, it's kind of like a musical melody, and it's a rhythm that's built into your life. It's not... So many of us, when we step back and look at it, we would say, we would say it's ritual. And obviously, for, it can become that. But its intent is to be rhythm. Its intent is to be a part of you, of a relationship. Just like you have a relationship with someone you love in your life that's close to you, whether it's a husband or a wife or a child or whatever, there is a rhythm to it. There are things that you do consistently. There are things that you practice consistently in that relationship as far as communication goes, hopefully that it, to build upon the intimacy that you have with one another. That There is a, a continual discovery, no matter how long you've been together, that there are things that you're discovering about yourselves together and about your spouse or, or about your children. You're learning things about them. There's qualities that you're discovering because of that interaction that you're having that's woven into your life you know it's not like for for most of us it's not like okay today from seven o'clock to seven fifteen i'm going to sit down and look at my wife or my husband and we're going to talk and then when seven fifteen's over with we're not going to talk anymore the rest of the day and then at a certain note we're going to sit down and talk you know it's not like that that's not that's stiff that's ritual and it's lifeless it's lifeless because it's something you're making yourself or forcing yourself to do from the standpoint of checking off a box, get it done so you can say you've done it. Tragically, for so many people, prayer has become like that. And they see it as a box they got to tick off each day and say they've done their you know, spiritual or religious duty. This is what, not the way, and you'll see this in a minute, for a Hebrew as one of God's people, everything, everything they did in life was centered around Him. Everything. And everything that they did had significance to it. Even the clothing they wore had significance to it as to their identity and their relationship with Him. All of life was literally built around this relationship they had with God. And when we follow Christ in the new covenant, that's the way our life is to be. Everything that we do, 
Paul the apostle said it. Do all that you do to the glory of God. No matter what it is. Playing with your kids, cooking a meal, sleeping, taking a nap, playing, working, everything that you do. Do it all to and for the glory of God. So remember the disciples had come to Jesus and when they had observed Him praying, they asked Him to teach them to pray because they wanted to know this, this relationship that He had with God the Father was different. It was different than what they had seen in synagogue. It is different than what they had seen in their daily prayers. And they wanted to learn about how to have this intimacy with God. Well, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about prayer. And it's interesting what he says about it. So in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 5, notice what he says. He says, when you pray. Do you notice he's not hoping you'll pray? It is an assumption you're going to pray. He's talking to Jewish people. So prayer again, this is a part of their life. So he's saying, when you do it, this is a practice you're already doing, but when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues. Now remember, for the most part, we'll see that as well in a few minutes, most of the prayer was done standing. And not only that, if they were not in, in, in Jerusalem, they, they were to face Jerusalem. Remember, Daniel opened his window to face Jerusalem when he was in captivity. He opened it to face Jerusalem to pray because for them, that was the, the, the throne of God, as it were. That's where God dwelt. Mount Zion. That was his place. And so they would face wherever they were at in the world, they would turn. You know, if they're in the west, they're going to face to the east. If they're in the east, you know, they're going to face to the west. If they're in the south, they're going to face to the north. North to the south, they're going to be looking toward Jerusalem. When you pray, he said, don't be like the hypocrites when they stand in the synagogues or pray on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. You don't pray for people to see you pray. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Yeah, their reward is right there. Pe they're getting noticed by people, and that's what they want, and that's what their reward is. But you, when you pray... Go into your inner room. Close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So notice what he says. He says you go into a place where you're alone and it's not observable by anybody else. It's just you and God. And you're going to commune with Him. And He's going to reward you openly in your life as the fruit of this communion. Many times by answering those prayers that you're praying to Him. And when you are praying, don't use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Their confidence is not in whom they're praying. Their confidence is in what they are doing. And the words are empty and meaningless because they're not obviously coming from the heart. But of course, there's Gentiles, pagans, they're praying to pagan gods. And they're, you know, just like the prophets of Baal with Elijah, they're screaming and pleading and praying these phrases and all these things like magical formulas thinking it's going to get them something. He said, you don't do that. Again, because their concept was the God is out there, we're here, there's a sense of separation. We have to do, do, do in order to get, get, get from who, this God, this deity out there. And Jesus is trying to establish the fact, your father is not like that. You don't pray like that when you talk with him. He says, you, when you pray, don't be like them, for your father knows what you need even before you ask him. And he's invited us to ask. But he says, he knows what you need even before you ask him. So you don't have to, the concept again is, you don't have to be begging and pleading and you know, screaming and crying and doing all that. You're talking to your father. And you notice how Jesus has emphasized that several times already in this passage. Your father, your father, your father. He didn't say Elohim. He didn't say Yehovah. He didn't say that. He said, your father. 
this intimate relationship that you have with him. So it's an assumption, and he knows that they're going to pray. And he also knows that the prayers they're going to pray, many of them, are going to be the ones that we're going to look at today and next Sunday out of this, what was known as the Amidah, from which he extracts what we have as the Lord's Prayer. So when a Jewish person would pray this, and this would, again, would begin their day, this would be one of the first things they would do after sunset. Remember, generally the evening prayers were from 6.30 till you know, basically midnight. You had that time frame in which to, to complete them. And of course, from 12.30 a.m. And, and until 6-ish, you, you slept more, more or less. And most people obviously went to bed before that. And then when you woke up, you immediately turned to prayer. And between 6.30 and 12 noon, you had morning prayer. And then from 12.30 to 6 p.m., you had afternoon prayers. But most of the time, they were somewhere in the middle there where these prayers were worked in. This Amidah was prayed by the people. Many times, they would pray this by themselves. A lot of times, they would gather with people to pray this. Again, as we saw last week in the book of Acts, this is what the disciples were doing in the second chapter, they were in a place of prayer at 9 a.m. in the morning in the temple when the Spirit of God fell upon them. They were going through these morning prayers when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them and they were accused of being drunk after they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course, they said it's only you know 9 o'clock in the morning. No, we're not drunk. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. So here's what they would do. We're kind of going to go through this and, and sort of begin to see how, how Jesus extracts. Now, there's one thing. We read that passage out of Matthew about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There is one prayer that every day, twice a day for sure, a Jew is going to pray. Hebrews would pray. Jesus did this. And again, in some of the other passages where he talks about the most important commandment, he includes this portion uh, from the book of Deuteronomy. So let's throw up that first slide. And that is the hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. This is called the Shema, the Shema of Israel. And when a, a Jewish person would pray this, and generally they will pray this right when they wake up in the morning. When I, as I've been telling you, when you wake up, first thing, turn your heart and your mind to God. I love you, Lord. I love you, Father. I love you, Jesus. You know, telling God you love him. This is what they would do. And most of the time, if they were up already before they had prayed it, how they would do it is they would take their, they take their right hand and they cover their eyes. And the reason why they cover their eyes is simply for keeping away from distraction. They cover their eyes up, and here's what they say. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah, Elohenu, Yehovah, Echad. Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And they're not going to do it loud. In fact, most of the time, it's just a very calm voice. They're saying this to God. And this is an important prayer for them. This, for them, probably, this is one of the most important prayers because to recite this is for them, is what they're saying is, I am accepting the yoke of the kingdom of God on my shoulders. I am accepting the responsibilities of the relationship. I have with God. I am acknowledging my relationship to God. I am acknowledging my commitment to His commandments. I am taking His yoke upon me. Do you remember Jesus talking about something like that? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Again, this is not a concept. When He's talking to these people, He's taking things that they are familiar with and He's adding a new twist to them. There aren't strange things that he's saying, but he's putting them in a new context now in this whole relationship to them. It's done by them daily to remember their submission to God, that they are under his authority and that they are under his lordship. It is a summary for, for, of, for them of their faith. It is a summary of their life, their identity as a people and as a nation and their mission in the world. All of that in that one statement. This is significant to them. And this is why Jesus will quote this, and now why he said it is the first and foremost and greatest commandment, starting with this. And like I said, they'll cover their eyes. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. And generally, before they would go to sleep at night, in their bed, they take their hand and cover it. 
This is their last prayer. Many martyrs, Jewish martyrs throughout history, the very last words they ever utter are those words. Because again, it is the most significant part of their prayer life. Jesus would have done this. Because He was submitted to His Father. He had taken the yoke of His Father upon His shoulders. His obedience to His Father. He is acknowledging that twice a day, for sure, in the evening and in the morning. And many times they will follow it up with the statement, Blessed is the name of the glory of His kingdom forever and ever. Now remember, this phrase, when we, remember we talked about the Day of Atonement this past year? This phrase, after the priest will say certain things, that phrase, blessed is the name of the glory of His kingdom forever and ever, all the people would shout that. And remember, get on their faces, prostrate, and then get back up again, acknowledging this. Now, when you are alone, again, you say this, but it's in a whisper. And here it goes back. Jesus saying, when you go into your room alone, it's like in a whisper. You're not praying for anybody else to hear. And it's like after you've, you've done the Shema, it's, it, it's like, and in Hebrew it's, Baruch Shem Kavod Machuto Laolam Ba'et. Blessed be the name of the glory of His kingdom forever and ever. Now already in this, you're starting to see a theme about kingdom, God and His authority that's being taught. And so they begin a day acknowledging that. And then they will go into the quoting from the passage that Jesus talked about. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. When you walk by the way. When you lie down, and when you rise. When you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Do you notice how the whole of life now is included in that statement about loving God and His truth? It's, in, it's woven into everything you're doing all day long. And you are reminded about it all day through diff different things, through significant things. You're sitting at the dinner table and you're talking about God. You're communing with God, you're talking about God. You're at work, you're talking about God. You're, you're living out your, the commandments of God. When you're walking and doing, you know, walking down the road, you're, you're, you're thinking about the things of God. You're teaching it to your children. You're imparting it to your children. And not only that, when you come home at night, you're reminded immediately at the doorpost with a little mezuzah that's there on the doorpost with this passage of Scripture and little scrolls rolled up in it. And you're going to kiss it and remind yourself again, this house is under His authority. I'm under His authority. He's my God. I've identified myself with Him. You're going to wear it. With the Teflon that they will have, the little things you've probably seen, Jewish people, Orthodox Jews especially, with a little box right up here and then wrapped around leather strap, wrapped around their arm up to here with the little scriptures in it right there. Their, their mind and everything they do, you see, their thought life is to be controlled by God and His Word and their actions in dealing with other people is to be controlled and dictated by God and His Word. All of life. Everything you do is to be directed and consumed with His life. And your relationship with Him. Again, all that's part of prayer. And loving God with all your being. He says you will love the Lord your God with all your heart. The whole idea and concept of heart in the Hebrew mind is your physical and your spiritual desires. You're going to love God with all of that. You're going to love God when you eat. When you sleep. And the physical things that you do in life. The spiritual desires that you have are turned toward Him and you're loving Him like that with all of your heart. A heart that is undivided by uncertainty and double-mindedness. You are single-minded. Again, James, when he talked about a divided heart, 
or a, a divided mind, a double-minded man is thinking about this is a man whose life is not loving God with all of his being. With all your heart. With all of your soul. And in the mindset again of a Hebrew, this means that you are practicing. You are living out and placing your love and your devotion to God above your own life. Above your own life. The only thing that matters to you is Him. He's first. He's number one. With all your heart, with all your soul, and then with all of your might. Now, when we see, we see the word might, we think about strength and energy and power. But it's an interesting word there in the Hebrew. It's not strength like we think of it. It's the word called miold. And miold literally means greatly. And if you were to translate that literally, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your greatly. And people know, well, what do you mean with all your greatly? Well, one Jewish commentator, Rashi, says it literally means with all your wealth. All the material possession that you have, you are loving God with it and honoring Him with it. That's the reason why they think that Jesus said when the little widow woman went in and she put in all that she had, even though it was just a small amount compared to the Pharisee who did it and you know, put in this great amount and wanted everybody to notice it. She put in all that she, but notice what he said. She gave all that she had. She loved with all her might, all her wealth that she had, her heart, her soul, her wealth. So you're loving God, it says, with all of your being. And see, loving God in the mind of a Jewish person leads to and results in obedience to His commands. Jesus said, if you love Me, you will keep My commandments. You'll do what I ask of you. You'll, you'll, because again, His commandments, the Scripture says, are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. When the primary command and most and first and foremost important command is to love God and love other people. Even though it's difficult to do sometimes, it is not a burdensome, weighty command in the sense that it is hard and difficult to try to keep. You're learning. You're teaching. You're meditating upon God's Word. And all of that is part of prayer, of experiencing in communion with God. And then the next passage of Scripture, Deuteronomy 11, is another one that they will go immediately into quoting. Again, this is, th these are memorized. Children are taught this. I mean, when there's these little kids, they're, they're discussing this stuff when they're going especially to religious school and they're being educated in the synagogue. They, this is drilled into them, into their mind. They've got this stuff memorized. And they're quoting it out loud and they're part of their prayer. They're reminding themselves of God's Word. The next passage that we have is Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. I want you to notice what the Scripture says. It says, Now, if you listen obediently to my mitzvot or my commands, this is from a, a Jewish translation, that I am commanding you today to love Adonai, your God, and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will give rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the late rain, so that you may gather in your grain new wine and olive oil. And I will give grass in your field for your livestock, and you will eat and be satisfied. Watch yourselves so, so your heart is not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of Adonai will be kindled against you and he will shut up the sky so that there will be no rain and the soil will not yield its produce. Then you will perish quickly from the good land Adonai is giving you. Therefore, you are to set these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. Now notice what he says here. Set them. Memorize them. And again, from a child as they start their morning prayers, they're quoting this. They're, they are reciting this daily, three times a day. Reminding them of their devotion and the danger of idolatry and of turning away from God and of God's promise of blessing to them if they walk with Him and honor Him and how He will bless them and then to 
set the words of his in their heart and in their soul. And then he says, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes. You are to teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Notice what comes first. Not when you rise up, then lie down. When you lie down and when you rise up. Why? Because the day begins in the night for them at sunset. So when you lie down, this new day has begun, and you're going to begin your new day communing with me, remembering my truth, meditating upon it. You are to write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied on the land Adonai swore to give to your fathers as long as the heavens are above the earth. The most important thing that these people are doing. Now, again, most of the time, Orthodox, they're going to have these Teflon on their hand and on their head. And any time when they're wearing them, as they're reciting this, when it says that uh, you will fasten them on your hand is a sign. They'll reach over and touch them. Again, they're acknowledging. When they're reaching out and touching it, they're acknowledging God's authority over their life by His Word and their covenant relationship with Him. And then it says, let, your orna- and let them be as ornaments between your eyes. They're going to reach up and touch the one that's here at the top. And then they're going to kiss their fingertips. Because the idea there is of love and respect and devotion is truth. Many believe Jesus and his disciples wore Teflon. They would have been as, as Jewish men. They would have had these and worn them because this was, again, this was a commandment of God for them to do this, to honor him, to remember him in their communion and fellowship with him throughout the day. Now, they're going through this. This is, getting, this is, to be, this is ingrained in them as, from starting up here, children, as, as they're growing up, they're seeing daddy, mom, their older siblings do these things every day. It is, is it, again, it's a part of the rhythm of their life. Like for us, it's like we get up and we start the disciplines. If we got up, we got a certain routine that all of us mostly do, don't we? When we get up in the morning, there are certain things we do, A, B, C, D. This is part of the A, B, C, D for them. It's not just brushing their teeth and their, it's not just doing those things, but now this is a part of the rhythm because they are in a relationship with the living God and they are reminded about it again in everything that they do. And then as they're praying, they will go and we'll go to this next passage of Scripture in Numbers chapter 15. Most of you would recognize if you've ever seen any kind of movies about Jesus, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize one of these prayer cloths, one of these prayer things. And most of the time, the guys wore these things all the time, wherever they went. And they will put these things over their shoulders like this. And when they're praying, they do that. And then they'll take it, and they fold it back, and they'll put it over their head like a covering because what they see this as is it's like a, you're a mini tabernacle. This is like the tent covering in the wilderness. You are a mini tabernacle holding the presence of God. And when they come to this portion of it, they'll pull this, they'll pull this, and many times they'll start prayers out with this, covering their heads up, showing that they're under God's authority. And a lot of what Paul talks about, even in Corinthians, is in reference to some of this. But they cover their heads up, and when they come to this portion in the book of Numbers, here in Numbers chapter 15, it says, And Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Benai Israel, the sons of Israel, say to them that they are to make for themselves tzitzit, on the corners of their garments. What you see here on the corners of this, right here, these tassels on the four corners are called seat seat. And, and the seat seat, notice what he says. On the corners of their garments throughout their generations, and they are to put a blue cord or the, a techelet on each cord on the seat seat. And this blue cord was a special color made from a unique snail, and, and it's a royal blue color. It's a special blue that people say that it must mean something to God significantly on the corners of their teat seat. And then, is it, we got any more after that? Beyond that? Okay. And it will be your own seat seat. So whenever you look at them, so when they're praying, 
And when they're reading this portion, portion of Scripture and they're, they're talking about the seat seat, they're going to come and they're going to find these corners. They're going to gather them up in their hand and they're going to bring it before their eyes and they hold it in front of them to look at it. And they said, when, when you see this, he says, whenever you look at them, you will remember all the mitzvot or the commandments of Adonai and do them and not go spying out after your own hearts and your own eyes or prostituting yourselves. This way you will remember and obey all my mitzvot or my commandments and you will be holy to your God. I am Adonai your God. I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am Adonai your God. And they'll look at it and they'll hold it because these remind them of His commandments. And every time they will say the word tzitzit, they will kiss them. They will kiss them. Now, do you remember the woman who had the issue of blood that wanted to reach up? And if I just touch the hem of his garment, those are what she was reaching out to touch. Because the Jewish men would have these hanging from the garments. Either Jesus was wearing a shawl that was hanging down, and she reached up and simply touched the seat seat. Or at the bottom of whatever overcovering he was wearing, these were hanging. And she reached out and touched them and was healed. And Jesus would have worn these. Jewish men today wear these on the, a part of the prayer, as a prayer shawl, but as well, they'll wear them uh, throughout the day. Sometimes they'll have an undergarment that has them on it and they'll pull them out over their belt straps because all day long, again, remember what this, he just said about this is command. When they see these things, they remember God's word and their relationship to him. They're reminded of that. They get ready to commit sin and they look down and that's dangling. They remember His commandments. And so as they would begin a day, they're starting out with all of this in their prayer, reminding them of their relationship to the living God. Several times a day, it's rhythm. And all of life is significant. He can say, well, we don't have to wear that kind of stuff. No, but now we have someone living inside of us who reminds us, who teaches us to love His commands, who reminds us before we step in the wrong direction, stop! Remember who you belong to. Remember whose you are. Remember His Word. It is all part of the relationship of prayer. And once they have quoted these, and it only takes a few minutes. It's not as long as what we've made this morning. Just a few minutes. They will begin the, the Amidah. And as they begin the Amidah, they begin the first and foremost. Remember, there was 19 what they call blessings or prayers in a part of this. There's the first three, which are blessings of praise. The last three are blessings of thanksgiving and gratitude, and the petitions and intercession are the 13 in between. And we'll just deal with the first three real quick of blessings, of praise to God. They would begin by saying, Blessed are you, O Lord God, God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and revered God, the Most High God, who bestows loving kindnesses, the Creator of all, who recalls the good deeds of the fathers and who brings a Redeemer to their children's children for His name's sake in love. O oh, King, Helper, Savior, Shield, blessed are You, O Lord, the Shield of Abraham. And when they would pray this, whenever they would see, say the words blessed, they bend their knees, and then they would say, you, blessed are you, O Lord, and stand up. Remember, they're standing there facing Jerusalem. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, acknowledging His authority to them. And then the next one, they would go to, you are Lord, you are mighty forever. 
You are the reviver of the dead. You are greatly able to save. You sustain the living in loving kindness. You revive the dead with great compassion. You support the falling. You heal the sick, set free the bound, and keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. Who is like you, O master of mighty deeds? Who compares to you a king who puts to death and restores to life and brings forth salvation? And you are faithful to revive the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who revives the dead. Now, I, I get excited when I pray these things. I get a little louder probably than what they do because most of the time they are doing this in a whisper, in the quietness of their room. But they're praising. Unless they're with a congregation and they're doing this and reciting this together collectively as they would on Sabbath. They're giving adoration and praise to the Most High God. And from the end of Passover, there's a little note here, from the end of, or end of the Feast of Tabernacles until the beginning of Passover, they add this phrase to it. You cause the wind to blow and the rain to fall. Because they are anticipating the rains to come for the growing season. And they're believing God and thanking Him already for what He's going to do for them in the coming harvests. And then they would say, the third one, you are holy. And I didn't have this one up here, but you are holy and your name is holy. And holy ones praise you every day, Selah, which means you stop and you pause. And you think upon this. And then you go forward. Blessed are you, O Lord, the holy God. We will sanctify your name in this world just as it is sanctified in the highest heavens, as it is written by your prophet. And they call out to one another and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And those facing them praise God, saying, Blessed be the presence of the Lord in His place. And in your holy word it is written, saying, The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. Throughout all generations we will declare your greatness. And to all eternity we will proclaim your holiness. Your praise, our God, shall never depart from our mouth. For you are a great and holy God. And blessed are you, O Lord, the holy God. You are holy, and your name is holy. And your holy ones praise you daily. Selah. Blessed are you, Adonai, the God who is holy. The first three blessings of praise. The whole of the Amidah, if you pray it, and I, I, I do this, I'll incorporate it in my prayer life sometimes regularly, sometimes intermittently. I use it just to change things up. But if you do the whole thing, maybe 20 minutes at the most of your day. Three times a day, so you end up with an hour an hour of your day that you've given to prayer. Con con concentrated, aware, attentive prayer in that sense. But you've woven these truths throughout your life all throughout the day. Now I want you to notice, one, this would have been something Jesus did three times a day. No matter where He was at. When they would stop, if they were on the roadside, out in the wilderness somewhere, they were going to do this. When he went to bed, he would say the Shema. I can't imagine Jesus lying there by a fire, looking up at the heavens. Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Echad. Paruk Shem Kavod, Machuto La Olam Vayet. Looking up at the heavens. We went to sleep. Remembering his relationship with his father. It was incorporated into his life. Everything had significance. Now, I hope you can see there's already two themes coming out from this. Kingdom and the holiness of God's name and the father who is in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your 
kingdom come. Now, there are a lot more words here, but Jesus is taking out the principles. He's extracting from this prayer, daily prayer, and now he's giving them a a different version of it. An easily memorized one. Very easy to memorize. We all know it by heart. And to be able to pray this, as the early Christians did, three times a day. Remember, everything had significance. Every word carried weight to it. Every part of it did. Every garment. Their clothing, the way their clothing was made, the food they ate, everything had significance to them about their relationship with God. For them to do all that they do, they were doing it to the glory of God, honoring Him as Paul takes. And again, Paul is taking a Hebraic reality, an understanding of a way of life for them, and he's not telling the Gentiles, no, you've got to wear certain garments, you've got to you know, wear the prayer shawls, and you've got to have seat seat and all that kind of... No, 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 he's not telling them that. But he's saying the principles about these things are now brought into this new covenant by means of the Spirit of God. Now His Spirit lives in you. His commands are written on your heart, not on tables of stone. And now the place of of love and obedience is flowing from within you. He's, He's reminding you. He's guiding you into all truth. He's reminding you of the beauty of God's commandments. He's reminding you of a beautiful way of life, of living with God. He's leading you into communion and fellowship with God as you pray and commune with Him. All of their life was consumed with fellowship and communion with God. And they reminded themselves of that three times a day. And still do, if they're orthodox. Still do. So I hope you're beginning to see that when Jesus gives us that prayer, He's pulling from something. He's just not you know, pulling stuff out of the air. He's extracting from something very familiar to them. And now he's handing it to them in a, on, a, on a small little plate. But again, even within that, and we'll see that, these principles are there, and that you, can, you take one statement and you can roll off of that. Remember how we did the Psalm 23? Remember that a, while, a few weeks back? Lord, you're my shepherd, and begin to draw communion over. My Father who is in heaven. Oh, you're my Father. I love you being my Father. I love that you've brought me into relationship with you as my father. You're in heaven. You're on the throne. You rule over all. But not only are you in heaven, you're in me. You dwell in me. You see, you roll this and begin to develop communion off of it. And that was ultimately, and you'll see this, Jesus' intent with it. I'm giving you a skeleton. Now you put meat and bones on it. You put the meat and bones. I'm handing you the framework. You build the building around it. You fill the house in your fellowship and communion with me. Is that understandable? Nod your head if it's understandable, okay? All right. Well, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your commandments. We thank you for the opportunity to live in communion and fellowship with you. Help us to remember that all of our life is to be living in rhythm of a relationship with You, the living God. Thank You, Holy Spirit, that You have become our seat seat. You remind us of our devotion to the Word of God and to our love for the Lord Jesus. Thank You that Your Word is now in our mind and it controls our dealings with others from our heart. And we may not be wearing Teflon upon our head or wrapped around our hands, but we have You to guide us and lead us into the way we think and how we act and deal with others. Thank You for being such a beautifully smart God to paint pictures and give physical illustrations 
of eternal realities. Teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen.